Let's get into our study. If you would, go ahead and get your Bibles out. There's Bibles underneath your chairs and there's baskets around you. If you don't have one with you, or if you want to keep it, take it home, that's fine too. Uh, version for those who use the app, is up and running as well as we get back into Acts chapter 2. And as you turn there, let me just kind of talk a little bit, because this is the last study in a five-week study that we have been doing. It's, it kind of partners with the study we did before that, which is how do we find spiritual restoration as individuals. And we spent three weeks in Psalms 23 just on that principle. If you feel disconnected from God, if you feel overwhelmed with life, whatever the case would be, as individuals, how do we find spiritual restoration? This one is how do we find spiritual restoration as a local body church? And specifically for us sitting here today, for most of us at least, how do we find spiritual restoration within the Shepherd's Fellowship? Any areas that we're maybe have a struggle with, or just that there's a season that's coming to an end and a new season coming to place. There's nothing bad happening behind the scenes. There's no weirdness going on. But it's always a matter of fresh anointing through the Holy Spirit. So how do we find that as a church family? We've been doing that in Acts chapter 2. And why we've been in Acts chapter 2 is because this section, this 42 through 47, is the first local body church. This is right after Jesus' death and resurrection. It's after his 40 days after that time, restoring and rebuilding and commissioning the church. It is after his ascension, and the apostles have been commanded to go back to the upper room and to wait for the Holy Spirit to come. After Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit showed up, that was a good day. A lot of power, a lot of authority came into, and they went out and they started the mission that you and I are called to as well today. If you have accepted Jesus as leader and forgiver in your life, by acknowledging with your mouth he's the Son of God, believe in your heart, died and rose again, and turn your life over to him, the mission we're called to, the work that we're called to, is to lead others to the Lord, to baptize them, and to disciple one another, to teach each other, to obey everything that Christ has called us to, to, to continue to grow, to be more Christ-like. And here, as they're going into that mission as a community, as they're really digging into that understanding, and a lot of people have come in, we know at this point, there's at least 3,140 followers because it started with 140 in the upper room, 3,000 came to know Jesus the first day, and now there's even more. We see what that community looked like, what the local body church is called to be. So let's read through that, then we will kind of go through. I do want to do some extra recap today because I know you get to the end of one and you're a visitor or you haven't been able to be here for a little while and you walk in and you're like, great, I have no idea what's going on. Well, make sure we give you some on-ramps and then we'll dig into what I think is probably going to be the biggest challenge that we've come across, as well as the biggest promise of payoff that comes involved. So let's read this, get us all on the same page in the next two of what that early church looked like, and then we can start dreaming and start challenging each other together. It says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all, as anyone had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Here's what we've covered so far, just to kind of give you the gist. And if this stands out to you, again, all of these studies are available on the church website. That you can go back and watch them on video or on audio to get the extended versions. But just to give you a little bit of a nugget type feel of it. When we look at a church community that's so passionate, so powerful, so overwhelming as this church in Jerusalem... And again, we're never always going to be perfect. It's just a few chapters later that they're not already having some problems because we're people. But when this is what God's called us to be, when this is the utopia, two things have to fall into place. The Holy Spirit giving His power, His Holy Spirit coming into the mix, because we cannot do this without God. We just can't. I'm just not that good of a person. Amen? I hope you're talking about me and not just... You know, not be like, okay, you guys know what I mean. But we need the power of the Holy Spirit. Then we need to choose to do our part. It takes both. It, a lot of times I'll talk to people that's like, man, it doesn't seem like God's showing up. God's not doing anything. I'm disconnected from God. And what we'll find is that the Holy Spirit's ready to move, but we keep making choices outside of what he would call us to do that stops that from happening. It takes both. It takes the Holy Spirit and us 
being devoted. That very first word that we have within it, giving ourselves up for something else, sacrificing ourselves for something else, making conscious decisions in certain areas that it's not about Tom, but it's about this. What God's doing in the local body church is what we find that we are most closely connected with one another to be able to do these things. And so we see them working within that local body to be able to move forward in great and powerful ways together. Uh, And what I, I think is awesome within that is the impact that comes from it. To jump from the beginning to the end is that there's a double impact within this community. There was impact within their lives, the change that we see, the community that they're a part of, but we also see the impact within the community around them as others are coming to know the Lord daily. That it has a twofold purpose that we're designed for. We're designed for. And I know if you're a little bit more introverted, I know if you've been kind of hurt by church before, it can be like, I don't know if I agree with that. It's designed for me. But we all need love. We all need community. It just looks different in different ways. That's what family's all about, and it's okay. And as we unpack this and we kind of go through these different sections, we found three main areas that they were making conscious choices in to be able to have the fullness of what we see within the community. There was relational choices, there was relational uh, generosity choices, and serving choices. As we go through it, and they were devoted to the teaching, as they were devoted to the scripture, to the word, as they were devoted to fellowship with one another. These are choices they were making to be relational. When we see that they're selling their stuff, their extra stuff, and giving freely to be able to help each other as people have need. There's a difference between need and want, but no one had a need, according to what you go to chapter 4, right? And we looked at the fullness of generosity throughout the word, the Old Testament, Jesus' time, the New Testament, what it looks like in the church, so that we make sure that we to have generosity to cover the ministry of the local body church, like we see with the apostles that they were freely giving of, of the, the, uh, everything God's entrusted them with the miracles and the signs, but also the generosity within one another and being able to take care of each other, and then that they made conscious choices in serving, that they were meeting daily, daily, not just in the synagogue with the formal worship, like what we do kind of on Sunday mornings, but also relationally in each other's homes, and they were serving each other, they were taking care of each other, that they were, they were bringing all the gifts that God has given us to be able to serve others, to be able to be part of that discipleship and that l- reaching out to others in a way that's powerful and impactful. So relational, it's really, as we talked about it, is mostly about showing up, showing up, opening up and reaching out. It's just that simple. You will never find a church where you feel like you fit in, you feel like it's family, if you come once a month and, we, and, and, you, and you don't talk to anybody. It just doesn't happen. And I literally, I've talked to people just like, that church, it's a piece of junk. They don't, they, uh, they don't like me. They don't like well, really, you know, how's that been going? Well, you know, last time I was there was about two years ago. <laughs> Show up. Show up. That's, how we, that's, how, that's why we have family reunions. We get together with people we love and the people that annoy the daylights out of us so that we can be together. Show up. It's relational. Generosity-wise, again, we are made to make sure that when it comes to our finances and our resources, that God is first just like everything else. Just like everything else. To be devoted to it. To make sure... That, the, that, the, that, the, that everything's in the storehouse that's needed for the ministry in the hand and also that everybody is being taken care of and we're loving one another. Now, it's a political year, so now everybody's going, oh, that sounds like socialism. I'm just telling you what's in the Bible. We take care of each other. Take our excess, we take care of each other. And th- that is one way, one main way, because money and resources by far is one of the biggest idols in this world. And, I, and I, I'm telling you, if we're going to be honest about it, and I've been trying to be just really blunt on all this, if I sit in this room and I say, if I give what God's put in my heart to give, and I'm afraid that I can't pay the electric bill, and I say, well, if I keep the money, then I have control over it, money's an idol, because he's the provider. Now, that doesn't mean that we just sign your paycheck over to Tom, and I mean, my wife won't even do that, but, you know, and like everything is well... We use stewardship. We, we've said we've got courses to help with budge, budgeting. I can sit and work with you on that. That's kind of one of the areas that I work within as far as administration and structuring. Love to help you. No one's taken me up on that. Would love to be part of that, to be able to help you, to make sure that God's first in all areas of our life, including resources, and then serving again. We, as we said last week, it says very plainly, Paul says God has given you freedom. Through Jesus Christ, he's given you freedom. And it was, it did not even put a period. 
said, now use that freedom not just for yourself, not for you, but to serve others in love. That anytime he's given me a gift, it's not so that Tom can use it just for Tom's benefit. Surely there's blessings and, and things that God helps me with my life, but I'm supposed to use those things to invest into the kingdom. I'm called to the Great Commission. Everything we do should be contextualized with the gospel message. That's what we see within the early church. And it impacted their lives personally and impacted the community that's around them. So, how to tackle it from there? That's been my question all week. How do we bring it all together in such a way as the Spirit can move? And I have been debating that all the way through the worship service through music this morning, exactly how we're going to do that. And I think I've got a little bit of an inkling, so we're going to go for it. But I want to make sure that we get the gap principle up there because this is going to be straightforward. And it's going to be very, very honest. And it's going to be very, very, I think, bold from what the Spirit wants to do. So here's what the gap principle is. As Chris laps that up for me, the little chart, you got it? Sweet. Uh, If you've been here, we've seen this every week. Uh, this is something that came out of Bible study with Josh and Amy Cramp, and we were going through Acts 2 together just within the last month. That as we look where, where God calls us to be, as far as your part within church community, we're also going to see and become very aware of where we're at. Where, where I'm at, and that's, if this is what God's calling me to be, it's just going to be natural that the Spirit's going to put our heart where we're at. The gap principle is that middle ground where it says, okay, I've identified some things I'm falling short on. How do I move forward? And I've been joking a lot of, okay, when you see that up there, think about that because you have two choices. One, you can either be mad at Tom for bringing it up, or you can see it as something that you can grow within. Past that, in all honesty, you can be as mad at me as you want. Thankfully, nobody has been to my knowledge. Thank you. But you can be, because this has nothing to do with Tom. What the gap is there to do is to push us to grow. So it really comes down to not anything to do with Tom, but am I going to grow in one or two or three areas as I continue to grow more like Christ and community, or am I not? That's what the gap reveals as we dig into it. So if we're going to have an understanding, we're going to have to change our, uh, our structure a little bit that I've been using for the last few weeks and look at where we're at as a church. We usually have a couple family meetings a year. Uh, that's our version of business meetings. We don't really like business meetings as much as the family getting together and talk about things. We've been tardy on that, to be honest, because a lot of things that we've been going through uh, with growth and changes in ministries and different seasons have been going so fast, it all ends up being here on Sunday morning or emails or newsletters. So we really haven't had a family meeting. This is a family meeting. Where are we at? How are we doing as a community? And I can tell you, once again, a billion times over, I love this church. I love this church. Unless if it's God himself that moves me, I love being here. I think I've been spoiled in comparison to some of the things I've been involved with in the past and my growing up years with church. I understand how people can get hurt by church sometimes because I've been there. And I just, I love this. Now, that doesn't mean that somebody can't be in this room and not get the feelings hurt. We're people. I love all the highs and the lows of our church family. I know some people are like, oh, we took a six-week sabbatical. Is he leaving? No, you're stuck with me. So God kicks me out. I love this church. I love the, the honesty. I love the relationships. And I love what we've experienced here as a family. But yeah, there's areas where we struggle, especially right now. As you come into the beginning of September, for the last three years, four years, um, we've had to deal with the summer slump mentality with as a church. Before that, we were a smaller church. Everybody was kind of in. But when we had that, that kind of big growth three, four years ago, um, we now have the joy of uh, something that nauseates me to death called the summer slump. And that's when people get busy and they got family events and they got vacations and they got this and that. And you don't see everybody and the attendance goes down and the finances go down. We, we get impacted by that now. And let me just say, before anybody gets mad at me, I'm cool with vacations. And I'm cool with stuff coming up sometimes. I'm going to be gone two weeks in October because we're going on a vacation. And we'll see you on the back end of it. I'm kind of looking forward to it, to be honest. Just having that, t- that time w- with them o- outside of state. I'm okay with that. I'm not preaching against that. But when you're gone for four, five, six weeks in a row, and you get an email that says, man, we're just really missing you. Oh, I get it, but the kids have this, and we have that, and we're doing the family thing here, and we've got this. And you start having, having a list of things. 
know that you're up against the gap. It's very possible you're making decisions off of the affluence of all the things that are available and you're putting local church last. You're not putting God last, but what he's doing through community you are. Because if you can make that list and then you put, oh, by the way, church is so important to me, I just don't have time. There might be something to talk to God about. There might be something to lean into the gap on. Does that make sense? I'm not trying to beat anybody up, but we see it time and time and time again. I have people come to me, like if you, if you look around today, I have people come to me and say, man, we're losing people. We're losing people. We've lost two families over the summer. Uh, one, I believe, is very God-led. The other ones are still kind of leaning into what's going on. I think they have some different things that they're struggling with between them and the Lord. Outside of that, everybody's here. We're just not consistent. And I could care less about numbers, but consistency matters. Consistency matters. And so we're struggling a little bit. You get at the end of August, beginning of September, the conversations I start having, and I'm not talking about anybody because I have this conversation many times a week. It doesn't feel the way it used to. I don't feel connected anymore. I've been serving here. It doesn't feel the same way. And we get into quit mode. We get into quick mode in, in a big way in August and September. So that's part of the reality of what's there. And I understand if you're in that place. We love you. And I'm telling you, if you get past the honeymoon phase and you work through that, there's a maturity and there's a depth to the other side that's worth it. I was talking to somebody the other day. I almost wish I could just encourage everybody, be part of a local church here or any place else, because again, this is radio show and, and um, broadcast or the, the video podcast and whatnot, be part of a church for five years and say, I'm not going to leave. Again, there might be massive, major wrong things or the teacher wrong thing, get out. But when it gets hard, I'm going to stick through it. And you'll experience community like you've never had it before in church. It's when we switch every two or three years because it doesn't feel like it used to that we end up having immature relationships within the body of Christ. So we do have some areas that we're in the gap. We do. Uh, Generosity-wise, uh, pretty much the same talk. Summer slump. Everything goes down. We stop spending money anywhere outside of ministry. Uh, we, we do that going into it because we know that as much as I hate it, it's a reality. Prayfully, prayfully as we go into September, go into October, those things start coming back around. It's generally not that people are upset about something so they stop giving. It's that they go on vacation and I just got a tithe holiday. Or I, I'm out and about, and I, I don't think about doing direct bank or those other resources we talked about. It, it ends up dropping things financially, resource-wise, for the ministry. Uh, we're doing okay. We're down. Okay, this family means so you get all kinds of stuff. Um, we're down f- about $1,500 from our reserve spot, which basically what that is, is this is where we kind of like to keep the general fund so we know if we do have tough days, that, that, that there's something there we can survive a couple months before it gets really critical. Uh, we, we've eaten to about 1,500 of that. Uh, in August, we were down $2,000 from our normal giving. When we talked about generosity two weeks ago, and we did the offering at the end, and I told you up front, it was not a manipulation, but an opportunity to have response at the end. That offering was the lowest offering we had in August, and I think the lowest we had in the, in the entire summer. We have areas we're struggling. And you know what? We can get in September, and everybody who was giving can come back in, and we can have an abundance and we still have a problem because not everybody's being faithful to God in their finances. Uh, Service-wise, I'm really encouraged by how many people signed up last week uh, as part of the response of different areas they would like to serve within the church or at least learn about. And we are moving on those. Uh, if it was with the worship team, if it was with kids' ministry, if it was with Love, Inc., your names have already gone out to the leaders of those areas. Um, there's some others I still have to have some conversations with to get you to those leaders and some things in place. There's some that people brought up ideas that we are not doing yet. So we have to create ministries to match up to what's on your heart, and I'm so excited about that. So it's going to take a little bit more time. I've not forgotten you, but we're working on those ministries. Uh, Sandy's going to step into that office assistant position we had. I'm thrilled that we had three people say they would love to help with that. As we prayed about and looked at it, she's kind of got that makeup, that, those skills for that, so I appreciate the overabundance there. Um, and I can say, we still need kids' ministry. It's one of the most important ministries in our church. We have a great staff there that are dedicated. We had one person who's on break that stepped back in after last week. I'm thrilled because she got great heart, great skills. But they need help. And I don't want them to burn out. 
So we can do that ministry for another year without a single person helping out. But these are our kids, and this is the time that they're spiritually growing in the spiritual formation like no other time in their life. I'd love to see more people in that area. And I would like to see as we get into special events, more people getting involved in the same 20%. There's areas that we can grow when it comes to the gap. Now here's the part I was debating. Do we drop the challenge there and make everybody win uncomfortable and then come up to the really good stuff? Or do we do some good stuff and then some crap and then some... And I think we're going to go to the challenge. The only thing that stops this is us not being devoted as individuals. The only thing that stops this from in your life is a lack of work. The only thing that stops this in your community is a lack of work. The only thing that takes and stops this from your kids' lives and your example as far as impact is a lack of devotion of not doing the, the calls, not making those changes. That is what brings the challenge. And I did have somebody, uh, I think it was two weeks ago, I was having lunch with them, and they were talking specifically in the area of prayer, but they asked, do you ever get frustrated as the pastor that we're going through all this, and it just seems that a lot of people are getting it as far as in the moment, but no real life change is happening. And I'll tell you, there's been some life change, and an individual here, individual here, we're not seeing anything where there's been like this massive change. Are you getting frustrated within that? And to be honest, there's times you feel like the guy in the video. There's times it's like, guys, we're right there, you know? But it doesn't last long because I realize I'm in the gap too. That we all struggle with this stuff. We all have the challenge within this. But it always comes down to if I'm not doing the decisions and the work and the devotion, that's where it takes and shortens the impact. So let me take you to 2 Thessalonians, and this will be the big challenge, and then we'll build out of it. 2 Thessalonians, so you're just going back a little bit from Acts, you're getting into the letters of Paul. And Paul has a section that he wrote to this church that he has quite a history with. They, they, they have a lot of challenges. They deal with a lot of persecution. They deal with a lot of people that are just against the church and Christianity as a whole. So much so that even when Paul and Silas and Timothy was done with their work in this city and went to another city, People from this city followed them to give them crap in the next city when it came to the ministry. I mean, it's just a, a very tough situation that they're in. And he writes a little bit about idleness. And I, I think when I read this, I, I see he's definitely talking about two different things at the exact same time. One is working for a living, doing what you can to work and earn your keep for a living. Uh, again, some of us have limitations, those type of things. He's not talking about that. He's talking about laziness. And then also the work of the kingdom. And if I read this in chapter 3, starting in verse 6, he says, Now we command you, brothers, first off, make sure you get that word command. We command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You can't make it any more straightforward than that. We won't wait than that. I command you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, within the body of Christ, brothers, sisters, that you keep away from any brother, any sister who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command, if anyone is not willing to work, let them not eat. Have that at the food pantry meeting, right? For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, and you're not busy at the work, but you're being busybodies. You've got extra time in your hands, so you're gossiping, you're judging everybody else, you're judging the pastor, you're judging all kinds of stuff going on, but because you're not working, you're being idle. You're not busy at work, but you're a busybody. Verse 12, now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he might be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. If you see this from the work standpoint and the physical standpoint, there's definitely there, that there. Don't let them eat if they're not working, if they just want to be lazy and everybody else take care of them. All of a sudden, the socialism comment from a few minutes ago goes right out the window. There's a lot there that we look at as far as being workers in, the, in this, this world and owning our keep. But at the same standpoint, as I put this in the context of the full letter, 
I've got work to be doing within the body of Christ to impact this world. And there's nothing more important than that. I fully believe that. There's nothing more important than that. That does not mean I blow off my wife and my kids. They're part of that. The impact I want to have there is, comes from my devotion. Here he's saying if you're being idle, warn them as a brother. Actually, he's saying put them to the side. I'm not real big on public shaming. Maybe God would get me on that if I'm reading that wrong. But I am really big on letting the word sit into each and every one of our hearts and say, is there a warning here for me? Is there a promise here for me? And which one do I want? So let's look at this. Let's take it on, on the, the, the upside. Because I, like I said, I, I, I'd love to see for your sake and for my sake, and for the church's sake, and for the community's sake, as we pray these five <coughs> prayers, us making real choices that make a real difference instead of just continuing our comfort zones. So let's talk about the benefits uh, of the impact in our own personal lives. You know, I remember when I was growing, uh, when I was in my 20s, it was about two years I worked at an insurance company, and we had to go through quality control training all the time. And one of the things they talked about from a management standpoint is RIFMs. Has anybody ever heard of RIFMs before? Okay, yes, okay. It's kind of the, the Crosby quality. Uh, I think it goes into some other things. It stands for what's in it for me and that people like what's in it for me. Um, that is true of us. It's not all about us, but what's in it for you. And I, I looked up, uh, like, like I did, I've been doing these lists of challenges. I want to give these lists of encouragements. Uh, in Relevant Magazine, which is a magazine I like, it kind of talks about the gospel living in the modern day uh, context. And they had one that talked about what are the benefits of being in church community. And as I looked at it, and they started grouping very easily under these three categories. So I'll just throw them out to you for, for your thoughts. When it comes to you, when it comes to your marriage, when it comes to your kids, when it comes to your family as individuals or your friends, when it comes to relationship, church community carries you emotionally. If you want the scriptures on this, I'll, I'll send them out for you later, but this is Galatians 6.2 talks about this, is that church carries you emotionally. I'm not always in the best mood. Sometimes I'm going through, I'm not even going to bring up your name, crap head. I'm <laughs> oh, sorry, that's an inside joke. It has nothing to do with everybody else, and now everybody wonders. I promise I'll be nice. But sometimes we wake up in a bad mood. Sometimes we, we take out going through a tough situation. Sometimes we have a situation with a child, within our marriage, or within our friends, or within our work. Sometimes we lose our job. I, my, my buddy Matt, I've been, um, pray for that, hasn't lost his job, but I'll share this with you. I've talked many times about my buddy Matt, best friend since fifth grade, diehard atheist for 40 years, came to the Lord last year, an incredible change I've seen in his life, in his marriage, uh, everything, his kids, his attitude, just a night and day change. I went for physical last week. He's a truck driver, drives over the road, been doing it for 15 years, has never found anything else that he liked. Took him 10 years to find what was him. Uh, he goes in for a physical, you have to get signed off on every two years. Um, you're not allowed to drive. He goes in, there's some problems. He went in uh, some tests Friday morning um, for sugar diabetes, which, I, as you know, I've been going through kind of on a slow scale for the last three years. He had no issues, no problems whatsoever with the sugar diabetes last year. Uh, went in for this test, and his sugar level was 273. For those who don't know about sugar diabetes, anything over 127, when you, and this is when he's fasting, um, 127, you're considered diabetic. I'm generally in fasting about 130 to 134. They told me at 200, call the office so we can document it. And that's that two hours after eating. That's not even fasting. And if it gets 250, get to the hospital now. My brother's at 273. And in his line of work, if he has to go on insulin, he's done. You cannot drive semi and be on insulin. You can have a pill. You can't have insulin. That's what's weighing on his shoulders while he's waiting for the rest of the test to come into place. Talk to the doctors and going on. And I talked to him, and I cannot tell you how encouraged I am that he's trusting in God, he's trusting in prayer, but he also says, I'm human and I'm stressing out. I fully get it, man. That's what we're here for. Church helps us and carries us emotionally. Our community empowers your relationship with God. How you see God, how you get expanded in God. A lot of that comes from Christian community. If my church is nature, and I go for a walk once a month and say that's how I'm connecting with God, that's not church the way the Bible defines it. It's connecting with God. God's beautiful. I love His creation. 
but I grow from your understanding, your experiences, your ways of dealing with things. I grow from seeing things from different perspectives and outside of myself. I grow within God because he has created us in his image. And through my brothers and sisters in Christ, I grow in my relationship with God in ways I don't. That's Proverbs 27, 17. Um, same book, Proverbs 17, 17, community helps meet our need for love. We talked about that earlier. It's relationship. It will not be there if you guard yourself. It won't be there if you're not around. But if you show up, open up, reach out, that's how you find Christian love through God through one another. And a lot of people here have experienced that. I love the testimonies from it. Will you get hurt sooner or later? Probably. We're humans. We're idiots. We will hurt each other. Sometimes we have a tough, tough things to talk about. But for the most part, it's an incredible foundation of love. And one of the reasons I love this particular church especially. James 5.16, community offers opportunities for confession, which leads to healing. Let me read that one again. Community offers opportunities for confession, which leads to healing. When I issue a challenge like 2 Thessalonians, it's not to make everybody feel like you're falling short, you're in the gap, you're losers. It is so that we see what God calls us to be so we can find that gap middle. And once we do, if some guilt comes with that, trust me, I felt some guilt on that too, and we're never meant to stay on guilt much more than one second. Because what guilt does is it's an invitation to come to God. And when we come to God, He quickly throws mercy and grace all over that and loves on us and gives us a new, new path, new purpose. He'll even use those screw-ups as a testimony to help others and to build His kingdom. So yes, there should be confession. There should be guilt. And then it should be mercy and grace right all over it so we can move forward in freedom because he never wanted us to be lost in guilt. That's not in the scripture in any way, shape, or form. And within church community, we have those safe environments as we build those relationships to sit down and talk. I had a, a conversation with a friend of mine uh, just two days ago uh, within the church. Incredible situation that they're going through in their, in their life. Um, and she was really nervous talking to me about it because of mis mistakes and some, some, some sin that was in that and what they were getting ready to deal with the ripple effects. And she told me, I said, okay, and let's talk and let's dig in. She's like, what does this mean? It means that we're here for you. It means that we're loved. She's like, you didn't even seem surprised when I said it. Nothing surprises Tom anymore. It takes a lot to surprise Tom, just to be honest with you. We all screw up. We all have problems. How can we be there for one another? That's what church community is. It's how do we go into the beauty of what God's about to do next. Um, that's part of church community, and we have that within our relationships. In uh, 1 Corinthians 1.10, community teaches us to work through conflicts. Real community teaches us how to communicate through the challenges that happen within the relationships uh, instead of just bolting. If, if it's bolting, it really was a community for you. Um, generosity, church meets the practical needs, and he actually uses Acts 2.42-47 through 47 with it. By being together, we meet the practical needs. The ministry that uh, I love doing, I could never do if it was just Tom operating out of his house. The ministry that we see and the testimonies that we see, not just for Tom, not just for the elders, not just for the teams and the staff, but for each one of us, if we plug into community, the things we get to be a part of are bigger than anything we can do by ourselves. And so that's why we support financially. That's why we support with our resources. And that's why we support with our time. Because when you make that connection with that kid at Boys and Girls Club, a place you would never go to by yourself, but you're there with a team, and you show up with some inflatables, and you're loving on families, and you meet that kid, and that kid's just, wow, that's an awesome kid. Look at the challenges in their lives. I've got to be praying for you. We're here for you. Anything we can do to help you, that happens in community. That's why the local church is, is, is so important. Again, we're just part of the bigger body, but we work together to be able to, to meet the practical needs within ministry, within church, uh, within the community. Um, yeah, there's a lot of beauty there. Service. Community reveals your gifts and your talents, Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12. We learn who we are through church, community. We learn who we are through others. If I took an assessment, a spiritual gift assessment we talked about last week, and I looked at it and said, nah, I don't know about this, maybe yeah, maybe that, and then I get together with three or four brothers and sisters and just say, this is what this has, does this have any merit? Do you know how often I see something like that happen and people go, yeah, I see you. I see you as a joyful person. I see you as somebody who shares joy, but I always feel like junk inside. 
No, I know that's how you feel, but as far as your gift, you really do spread joy. You really do make a difference in the lives of others. You really do light up those kids' lives. You really do excel behind the scenes. You, you really, and we start learning about ourselves through others because as much as in church, hey, don't have an ego, don't get conceited, but be confident in the Lord. And we need others to be confident within the Lord and to see who we are because most of us are much better at tearing ourselves down than building ourselves up. That's where community comes into play for ourselves. There's many benefits to you, your marriage, your family, your friends. Many, many ways that God impacts our lives through community. And if you're part of it here, I love it. And I pray you keep on leaning in. If somebody's listening to radio broadcasts, something like that, they're plugged in someplace else, awesome. Plug in well. But if somebody's been out of church, if somebody's been struggling with church, if somebody's been even hurt by church before, God has more than what you've experienced. And we see it in the scripture time after time after time. And I can tell you as one who's been hurt by church before, I would list two as major. It's worth it to lean in and grow through it. But what about the impact within the community? That's kind of a harder one to gauge, isn't it? We can talk about the events that we did this summer. We did a video of that just not too long ago. But I want to kind of do it a little bit of a different way. And Brian, if you would go ahead and turn that module on. I want to ask, and I kind of have people in mind. We'll see how the Spirit moves in this. Maybe three people to come up and just talk, whatever the Holy Spirit's putting on your heart, as far as maybe who you are, how you ended up coming to the Shepherd's Fellowship in the first place, and then anything you want to share testimony-wise off of everything that we've talked about. How's that? In two minutes or less. No, I'm just kidding. Just whatever the Spirit puts on your heart. Um, I've not asked anybody beforehand. I debated if we were even going to do this. Um, but everybody who's going to share today are people that have not been here 13 years like I have. Some have come out of uh, other church environments as God has led. Because, again, you don't always leave a church on bad terms. God led a family out of our church, and we did it with blessings and prayers um, like a few weeks ago. But some are just from the community. Some that I'm going to ask, I'm not even sure how you found us in the first place. But all of us are really nervous on who he's going to call first. Sandy Long, can I ask for your assistance? I started coming to the fellowship, I think it was four years ago. We went to another church, and we had been gone there, I think, five years. And I was beginning to sense an unrest. And I'm not even sure how Tom and I hooked up on Facebook through a mutual friend, I think. So I think we had just been talking back and forth for maybe six months or so. And I had made up my mind it was back to church Sunday. So the girls and I were going to come and support the fellowships back to church Sunday. Well, when we came, it was just like we had arrived. We were home, and I felt so comfortable here. Well, I didn't just walk out of my former church. I spoke to the pastor and his wife, and I told him why I was leaving, that I felt God was calling us to the fellowship because they offered more of an impact in the community. That seemed to be the heart. That seemed to be the passion. Not that I am a go-getter and go out into the community because that is not my comfort zone. But I, I, I like that, and I think God was kind of stretching my faith a little bit too. So I came to the fellowship, and I can't even explain, excuse me, I can't even explain the community feeling that I have because I think I mentioned once and he'll have to excuse me but I'm short of breath today so I have to kind of take a sigh every once in a while um, I think I mentioned in a testimony before that I don't think if I had a problem I think I could really go to any person in this room and talk to them about it because I feel they're my brother or they're my sister. I mean, that's just how 
comfortable I feel. Now, do I go to everybody? No. I think we all kind of have certain people that we have an affinity to. I think God leads us to certain people. But if I really had a problem and I was with you, I would have no problem sharing it and asking for your prayers and your support. And my girls feel the same way. And that is another important reason I came here, was because of the love for the kids, the love for the teens. And of course, back then, they were still in the kids' barn. And now that they're getting older, they love working the kids' barn. They love helping out in any way they can. So I think even the service heart that the fellowship has has definitely rubbed off on my girls, too. And I, and I can see them grow. <laughs> Talking about my girls, I'm going to cry. <laughs> because they mean so much to me. And each and every one of you have had a hand in helping them grow spiritually, too. And that just means the world to me. There are so many of you in here that they love. Just, I, I mean, they have no problem giving everybody hugs because they love you. And they talk about you when we're at home. Nice things. <laughs> nice things. But they talk about you. So that's, that's why the fellowship is so important to me. So important to me. Ray Gill, can I borrow you for a second, sir? I guess just to get started, um, I started coming to the fellowship about three, a little over three years. And um, I was in a time in my life where I, I met, actually, uh, most of you don't know, but I'll tell you right now, Karina and I are married. I know it's been back and forth. You're married, and it's a surprise. <laughs> and when I met her, yeah, thank you. Um, when I met Karina, um, I mean, she's just a wonderful, beautiful woman, and I, I was in a place in my life where she asked me if I go to church, and, and I've been part of churches. I mean, I've um, been a, um, part of some other churches where I felt God was in my life. I believed in God, and, but I never really had a connection with God, to be honest. I just, uh, I just felt I, I believed in God, and I had, you know, church in my life, and and when I met Karina, she invited me to the fellowship, and I said, yeah, I'm going to go to church. And so I came here, and it was probably, I don't know, probably the second or third time where I really felt something. I was like, you know, I really felt the spirit, and I was, like, getting connected. And, uh, and I shared it with her, and she was, she said, yeah, I mean, you know, you, you know, just turn it over to God. And so anyway, um, just a lot of things started happening to me. I, I mean, I felt... When I was here, I, I, I just started feeling the spirit. I was in, I was connected. I was like turning things over. I was praying about a lot of things. And um, so a lot, of, a lot of things happened in my life where um, I, I was a certain person that I didn't really agree that I was that way. And Karina was really showing me a, a lot of things. Um, so again, with the fellowship, um, I, I would come here and just, you know, I meet people, um, and I struggle with all this. I struggle with all this still. I mean, some of the things are getting better, some of the things. But I know one thing I do not struggle at all is where I'm supposed to be on Sunday. Sunday comes, and I, I just, I am here, and I, I, I just, I just feel like that's where I'm supposed to be. All the other stuff, God will, you know, he will help me deal with, he will help me grow, he will help me with these things. And the people I meet here are just, I mean, are just phenomenal. I, I, I mean, I can tell you, everybody I know that just pray for me, pray for Karina and our family, and are just there for us. I mean, it's, it's, just, a, it's just a special feeling where, yeah, church family, I, I, yeah, I can tell you this is my church family. I don't know all of you yet, but I know lots of you that I just, I just, I just love you. I just, I, you know, I just, you reach out. I mean, I've got two boys that I tell them they don't understand yet because they're not here. They don't know a lot about things that, that I've done in the past, but I tell them, 
this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. I, I found a home. <laughs> I found a place where I belong, and I just love it here. So um, I look forward. I hope I get to meet and you know, get to know each and every one of you. But uh, um, that's pretty much where I'm at. So. Dell, Cheryl, can I call you guys up together? Sometimes I talk, but I think he's the better one to talk today. That's a normal look. <laughs> now, isn't that a line? I had been a member of uh, Baptist Church for, goodness, probably close to 30 years. Uh, was baptized as an adult. Didn't really know the Lord till that time. And one day I was getting my glasses. I have a lady sitting over here, Marty, who picks my glasses for me. Cheryl sends me, I get my eyes checked, get new glasses, and she knows Marty will pick out something that looks good. So, but Marty told me about the church here, and it always stayed in the back of my mind. And uh, I served as an officer, different church moderator, and the whole, the whole gamut at the old church, but things started getting more uncomfortable all the time, a lot of politics, a lot of just everything. And we decided it was time to, to move. So we came down, and I fell in love with you guys. Even him. <laughs> yeah, you know? He's fun to have lunch with, too. But we, uh, I think we found a home, and we love it. What's fun for me is this is totally different from any concept that I've been involved with for church. And so it's been, um, for Dale, it was like, okay, this is it. I know. And I'm going, oh. <laughs> um, but I thank God that he brought us here together. I thank God that he made us a part of your family. I think one of the things that's really compelled me to want to be here all the time is how much, I'm really weird, but um, how much... <laughs> I like to learn and be challenged and to, um, and I feel that here. I come on Sunday and I learn and I go away and I go, ooh, I think I could probably do something different. And that's important to me, that the words being preached, that I know um, when Dale was in the hospital, I knew so much we knew so much love and support from you all, from people coming down to see us, to people um, following us on Caring Bridge. And quite honestly, apart from God's goodness and mercy and your love and your prayers and support, I'm... Don't forget Marty running up down on the elevator. Yeah, yeah. Well, and then it was crazy because Marty and I were there with our husbands at the same time. But... You know, we knew we were being loved and being held up and that you were bringing us across those 2,000 miles back to you and back to this place. And we thank God for all of you and being a part of our lives. We love you. And this next one I actually asked, but she's not nuts about it, but she's going to go for it in faith. Mary? About a year. Um, not crazy about speaking in front of a crowd, but thanks. Um, I've had family come here for a while. I've gone to church on and off throughout my life and didn't find one I was really comfortable with till I came here about a year ago. Was going through a lot in my life with a daughter who was sick with ALS and multiple sclerosis for a few years. Um, and everybody here has been great and supportive. And I think coming here and be surrounded by the love that this group of people have made that much easier. Um, to go through, so I know the women's group at Leslie's that we go to, go to has been great. We talk about everything, um, have a lot of laughs, a lot of support in that way too. Um, but I just think it's a great place no matter what you're going through, that they're very supportive, very loving, they check on you, um, and it's been a great place for me to come and be. So I'm still learning and growing. Um, and still learning a lot. I feel like I still have a lot to learn and 
to do all these things we need to do, but I think this is a great place to do it. So. All of us have been part of the community we're trying to reach at one point before we became community here. And every testimony being shared of the difference that is made through Christian community is not Tom, 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 Tom. It's Marty, it's Sandy, it's friends, it's family, it's us. It's us. And the way that we continue to impact people matters by us doing what God calls us to do on a daily basis and as a community together. Also